I'm sure every pastor in America has shared this joke, this sermon illustration. I'm sure you hear it before. It's a story of a uh, of the man who uh, had a two story house and uh, rain came and the flood came. Remember that story? And all of a sudden the Jeep comes by and says, Hey, the, the flood waters are starting to come up. You better, you need to get in this Jeep right now. He goes, No, no, no. I'm going to wait it out. He goes, God, God's going to come. I'm waiting for the Lord. And they drove down. Well, the water kept rising, kept rising up. And eventually they had to get boats out to rescue people. And so a boat came by his house. And now he was uh, up on the second floor. And they said, Sir, I said, You need to come down. These flood waters are rising. No, 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 no. I'm good. Uh, I'm, I have faith. I'm just waiting for the Lord. Well, the water kept rising. Eventually it forced a man to go on top of the roof of this two story house. And uh, a helicopter happened to be going around rescuing people and saw him and dropped a uh, rope down, a ladder rope, and said, Sir, you need to get on this rope. You're going to die. The flood water keeps rising. He goes, No, no, no. I'm trusting in God. God's going to come through for me. Well, the water kept rising and he drowned. He died. And he got up in heaven. He saw St. Peter to Gates and said, What happened? I was trusting in God and God let me down. And God peeped up and said, Hey, I don't know what else I can do. I sent you a Jeep. I sent you a boat and I sent you a helicopter, you know, what else you want me to do? You've heard that, haven't you? My gosh, that's been around the church forever. The, the point being that we can be focused on one thing and actually miss what we're really looking for. Tonight, we're going to conclude the series that we've been in uh, this Christmas season called the Christmas Conspiracy. It's been a series talking about the mysteries of of heaven that Jesus revealed to us when he was born in that manger a couple thousand years ago. Now, here's the third mystery, okay, that we're going to talk about tonight. Here's what Jesus brought down that we didn't know until he introduced it to us, is that he came down, the Messiah came to lead an army of love. He came down to lead an army, but it was an army of love. The Jews of Jesus' day, the, the people that were to be given the Messiah, the Messiah came through their race and was represented to the world. They were expecting a Messiah, but they were under Roman occupation. They were really downtrodden. People came into their land and, and it was their land and now they had to abide by Roman custom and so their prayer, their deep longing was, oh, send us a Messiah to free us from the Roman oppression. They wanted a military Messiah. And when Jesus allowed himself to be arrested and then crucified, the majority of Jews in that day and even to this day have rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Now, if you were to go to Israel today and, and ask the, the person common person on the street. Do you believe in a Messiah? Yes. Are you hoping for a Messiah? Yes. We know that he's going to come. The, the scriptures talk about it. They are looking for a Messiah, but they reject Jesus as the Messiah. But only if they had been focused on the right thing. If only they would have been looking where they should have been looking, they would have found him. But like the man in our story, they missed the Jeep, the boat, the helicopter, the man did. These people, the Jews, missed the help that was sent to him. Now, he didn't send them a jeep, boat, or helicopter, but he did send Isaiah, Micah, and Zechariah. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the promises that were made to the nation of Israel about their promised Messiah. Isaiah, the prophet, 700 years before Jesus was born, 700 years prophesied. Therefore, the Lord himself <clears throat> will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son. And she will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. All they had to do was just look in their sacred scriptures. They would have saw that the Messiah would be born through a virgin. And of course, don't you think that when Mary uh, became pregnant and, and word got out that, hey, she's claiming that, you know, she's never had relations with a man. She's claiming that God got her pregnant. Don't you know that that word had to get out? All they had to do was search the scriptures. They could have said, I know it seems impossible, but here's what Isaiah prophesied. They had Micah to come to them. 
700 years as well before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Micah prophesied, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth from me to be a ruler in Israel. All they had to do is that when Jesus came and, and, and uh, pronounced himself as the Messiah, all they had to do is to say, where were you born? Because if they'd been studying the scriptures, and if he just said Bethlehem, they said, hey, now we're going to listen. Because we know that the Messiah has to be born in Bethlehem, which Jesus was. But they, they weren't looking for it. They missed it. Well, Zechariah, 500 years before the birth of Jesus, he prophesied about the coming Messiah when he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and he's endowed with salvation. Humble, mounted on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Does that trigger any of your memories concerning Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem right before his arrest and crucifixion? That's how he came in. He didn't come in on this big military stallion. No, he came in humble on, on, on a donkey. But they missed it. Why? Because they weren't looking. They had on their mind, we, I, we hate the Romans so bad. We want a military guy. And they missed their Messiah. Rather than seeing that the Messiah would first come as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they focus only on the scriptures that describe the conquering Messiah at his second coming. See, Jesus' first coming was to become the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, to die for mankind's sins. Again, that was prophesied. Isaiah said of this, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. It talked about it. It says the Messiah is going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be pierced. Now, his second coming, which he is coming again, Jesus is coming back to earth again. His second coming will be to judge an unbelieving world and to establish his kingdom here on earth. He is coming back. He will come back as the conquering victorious king the second time. And so for over 2,000 years, what was prophesied in the book of Romans has been happening. Romans 11.25 says, For I do not want you to be, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. And here it is, that a partial hardening has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does that mean? It means that when the Jews rejected Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah, God turned his attention to Gentiles, which is anyone who is not Jewish. And, and the beginning of that focus uh, really took place in the book of Acts at Pentecost, when all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came and began to dwell believers and the church was formed. And so for 2,000 years, God has been focusing on Gentiles primarily. Not that Jews can't get saved, but God's focus primarily has been on non-Jewish people and building his church. Now, he described, well, first of all, once the church is raptured, once the church is raptured, at that point, God will now turn his attention back to the Jewish nation. And during the seven-year tribulation, you're going to see revival among Jewish people. Revival, we've talked about here before. But that won't take place until the church is raptured up. Now, Jesus himself, he described his purpose for being born in that manger in Bethlehem so many years ago. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was very clear. He didn't say, I've come to start a military campaign against the Romans. He goes, no, I came to seek and save those that were lost. John also said in John 3, 17, for God did not send the son in the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He came on a saving mission the first time. Now, although he didn't come and he didn't start a military army, he did build an army of passionate lovers of God and of people. And I'm going to leave you today with three types of love that Jesus had for others that he modeled for us, things that we should adopt on our own life. And here's the first way that Jesus loved. 
Jesus still loves people when the bottom falls out of their life. He still loves people. Let me just paraphrase a very familiar story if you're familiar with your Bible. It's the story of a woman caught in adultery in in John chapter 8. And and the story goes like this. Uh, The Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day were always trying to trap him, trying to to get him to trip himself up and so they could disqualify him. They didn't like what he was saying to them because he was convicting them. And so they brought a woman caught in adultery. Don't ask me how they caught her. Were they peeping toms? I don't know how, how they caught her. Anyway, they brought her up there and, and so embarrassing, threw her in front of Jesus, in front of everybody, and she's been caught in adultery, and all of a sudden her sin is on full display now. She's been caught in the very act of adultery. The Bible says, Jesus, that the penalty for that is being stoned, killed. What are you going to do about that? And I love, I love, I love Jesus' response. He didn't say a word, he just bent down. He began to write in the dirt. And the scripture says they kept persisting. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? They weren't getting it. And finally he says he was out sin, cast the first stone. And he bent down and he kept writing. And eventually it says starting from the oldest to the youngest, they began to walk away. What was he writing? It has to be. It has to be a list of their sins. It has to be some of the stuff that they're doing in private. Why else would they walk away? They, they would keep persisting. They, keep, they would keep being self-righteous and holy. But all of a sudden, they went over. What is he writing down? Oh, my gosh, he knows. <laughs> they began to walk away. I love it. I love it. So all, all her accusers are gone. And we pick up the story here. And here's, here's the two key verses right here. John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Straightening up. Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Go. Oh, by the way, from now on, sin no more. So he extended grace, but also holiness. I forgive you, but I don't even think I need to tell you not to sin anymore. I think your public humiliation probably cured you of that. Go and sin no more. And I think he gained right there a lifelong follower in this woman. Many people, like this woman, are, are leading secret lives. They're an employee at work. They're a mother. They're a father. They're a brother. They're a sister. Publicly. But privately, they're addicted to pain pills. Or... They're struggling with suicidal thoughts on a pretty regular basis. You never know it. Never know it. They're a manager at work. They're a volunteer in their church in public. Just a run-of-the-mill person. But you have no idea that they're addicted to pornography in private. Struggle with it. Struggle with it. Hate it, but can't get rid of it. They're a happy couple in public. Everybody thinks, boy, what what a great marriage they have. They just seem to be so kind and thoughtful to each other, it seems like. But in private, their marriage is slowly crumbling because the husband's abusive temper. He just can't control his temper. He knows it's wrong, but he just blows up. His dad blew up at his mom, and now he's blown up at his wife. It's, It's just slowly eroding their marriage. But here's the hope for us, for you that struggle with destructive habits in secret. That Jesus is ready when you step out of the shadows. He really is. He's not a fair weather God. When the curtains lifted on your private sin, Jesus will be there to help you through it. He was accused by the religious folk of his day of being a friend of sinners. And they thought that was a derogatory term. Look at the, the, the Jesus. He's a friend of sinners. And I think Jesus wore that title like a badge of honor. Yeah, I am a friend of sinners. And he, he truly is a friend of sinners. Second type of love that Jesus showed us, that the type of army that he wanted to build. Jesus won't leave you when you get lost in life. He won't leave you. Matthew, let me, let me read to you Matthew 18, a couple of verses here. Verse 12. What do you think? 
If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 in the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. The apostle Peter came to know this. After denying the Lord three times, after previously promising Jesus, I'll never leave you. I don't care, you know, everybody else might leave you. I will never leave you. And Jesus says, Peter, you will. In fact, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And in one of the gospels, the third, or the third time that Peter denied Jesus, the rooster crowed, and it says that Jesus, who was arrested, uh, was in the governor's house, and, and, and Peter was in the inner court mirror with John, and their eyes met. Jesus looked down, and Peter's eyes met. Can you imagine that, if you were Peter, that your eyes met, and all of a sudden, it's like, you're, you're, you're aware, like, oh my gosh, I did. I did deny him. He said I would, and I did. And I said that Peter just went and just fell into a ball of emotion, cried his eyes out. Eventually got so discouraged, he just said, I'm done. I'm going back fishing. I, I'm, I washed out as a disciple. I washed out as an apostle. I'm done. I knew I couldn't do it. Never been able to finish anything in my life. That's why I'm fishing. I couldn't get in rabbi school. It's, it's, what, it's what guys like me do. They mess up. There he is fishing. Of course, didn't catch anything all night, him and his buddies and all of a sudden, some Yahoo from the shore yells, catch any fish? Uh, Peter said, oh my gosh. No, throw your net on the other side. Oh my gosh, Peter said, my, can my life get any worse? I'm a pro. This guy, this, this recreational fisherman trying to tell me how to fish. Throw your net on the other side. I'm telling you. Why not? I haven't caught anything all night on Doing it my way, and he threw it over there, and all of a sudden, it says they brought in a hole so big the net began to rip, and they looked a little closer. Oh my gosh, that's Jesus! And in typical Peter fashion, he couldn't just row in like everybody else; he had to jump in and swim in. Of course, they all arrived at the same time, except Peter was now wet. It's Peter. And if you know the story there in John twenty and John twenty one, Jesus restored him. Say, hey, just go tend my sheep, get back on track. I called you to be a pastor. Just, just get back on track. Keep doing what I've called you to do. He'll come looking for you. He'll come looking for you. Not only will he come looking for you, but if you have a tendency to wander as a, as a habit, eventually what he'll do is, is he will help you not to wander. Sheep have a tendency to wander. We're, we're called sheep. And if you've been here before, you've heard us talk about what a shepherd in those days would do to a sheep who was prone to running off, leaving the 99 to go out there and get in trouble. What that shepherd would do eventually is he, he would take that lamb. Usually it's a lamb, just young, young lamb running off frisky. And he would take that lamb and he'd put his leg up on a rock and take a little hammer and he'd break the lamb's leg. He'd break it. Splint it. And then... What he'd have to do, because now the lamb couldn't walk, he would carry that lamb. He'd put him over his neck, and he'd carry that lamb, carry him for months, just walking around that lamb. He set the lamb down to eat, and then when they'd walk, he'd have to pick him up. And in the meantime, what was that lamb doing? He was, that lamb was really learning to depend upon the shepherd, learning to love the shepherd. They, they, they developed just a, a great relationship. And then once the leg was healed, they put the lamb down, and guess what? The lamb very rarely would ever wander off again. Why? Because he, he just fell in love with the shepherd. He just, he just said, why, why, did I, why would I go out there when, when I found what I want right here? And see, that's, that's what God will do sometimes. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 11 describes this process. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of of righteousness. Some of you may be in the process of being disciplined. And if that's the case, just hang in there. Let, let God do what he wants to do. It's all in love. It's all to steal your heart to him. So you never run off again. 
Lastly, here's, here's the third way that Jesus loved. Jesus is there when we're ready for a change. He's there when we're ready for a change. Again, the story of the, the prodigal son, a very familiar story, two sons, one of them, the younger one says, man, I, I, this is boring. This is boredomville here with dad, man. I want to go out. I want to experience the world. And says, dad, hey, I, I'm not called to be a farmer like you, man. Can I get my inheritance and go? I'm sure his dad tried to talk him out of it. And they said, no, nah, man, this is dull around here, man. There's, there's so much more excitement out there. And dad says, all right, fine. And gave him his inheritance. And the young guy ran off and partied it up for a while. And as often the case, especially when probably God is, is, is involved here, ran out of money. All of his friends left him. Famine hit. Couldn't get a job. Finally, the only job that this little Jewish boy could get was feeding pigs. Jews weren't even allowed to eat pigs, eat pork, and yet now he's feeding them. And he had to say, oh my gosh, I've hit rock bottom. He got so hungry, the Bible says, that he longed to eat the pods that were being fed to the pigs. That's hungry. And all of a sudden it says that he's sitting there in verse 15 of, or 17 of Luke 15 says, but when he came to his senses, I, I studied that out. That, that phrase has always stuck out to me. What turned this guy? But when he came to his senses, and as I Studied it out, I found out that the word sense is there. It, it's the word how to. It's spelled H A U T O U, but it's pronounced how to. And it's the definition of a baffling win. I thought that baffling, that definition. <laughs> baffling win, but the more I studied it out, I said, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. It's, it's the picture of someone who is at the end of the rope, someone who just said, Oh my gosh. What else is going to happen to me? Oh my gosh, just when I thought nothing worse could happen, this happened. And you just sit down and it's like this. You ever have those moments? That's a baffling win. And this younger son, you sit down there. I'm sure he sit right in the pig poop and just sit there and you said, Gosh, what have I done? Dummy, 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 dummy. I know what I'll do. <clears throat> I, I, I'm not worthy to be dad's son again, but you know what? I bet he needs some helpers and workers. And you know what? Right now, the workers' quarters where they sleep and what they eat, man, that'd be like going to a five-star restaurant compared to how I've been eating. I'll go back and I'll ask dad, say, hey, I don't even know your son. I know that's, a, that's over. I blew that chance. Uh, but can I work for you? Can, can I save the servants? And you know the story. He comes home, the dad sees him far off, runs out there, puts a coat on him, and, and the son goes into his spill. Wow, well, dad, I'm not, because no, 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 I don't want him. No, 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 no. We'll talk later. And he threw a party for his son and basically restored his son back to sonship. And see, that's who God is. That's who he is. It's, it's a picture of someone who's made terrible mistakes in their life. Horrible mistakes, got themselves in a pickle, getting everything their decisions have deserved them to get. And yet you've got a father who is merciful and comes and says, you know, I, I don't care about what's in the past. Yeah, you made mistakes. I think you've owned up to it. You confess it. Let's move on. Let, let's, let's get back with the program here. That's the kind of love that Jesus modeled for us. Well, I'm going to end encouraging you with a Christmas story, but I, I need the kids to help me today, okay? How many kids do we have in here? How many kids we got? No, no, that's not good enough, okay? Listen, on the count of three, I want every kid here to yell your name as loud as you can, okay? All right, every kid, I want, parents, you better plug your ears. <clears throat> I want every Young person, child, kid here to yell your name as loud as you can on three. You ready? One, two, three. All right. Let me ask you another question. <clears throat> How many of you like a good story? That you hear a good story at school or a good story at home or a good bedtime story? Okay, I, I want... That wasn't good enough. I raised my hands. Okay. On the count of three, I want you to yell, oh yeah. Okay, that you like stories, Okay. Do you like stories? Okay, on three, yell as loud as you can. Oh, yeah. One, two, three. 
All right, that's better. Okay. All right, kids, here's, here's what I want you to do, okay? This is story time. I want all the kids, come up here, come sit right up here. Okay, you're going to watch this story. Come on, kids, come on up. Go ahead and take a seat because you're going to be watching the screen, okay? We're going to move this. Take a seat. You're going to be looking at the screen, okay? Get a good seat. Get all across the front here. All the kids come. Come on up, kids. <clears throat> How many of you kids like snow? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you kids like birds? Okay, this is a story about snow and birds. But it also is a story about Jesus, okay? And I'm gonna ask you at the end where you think Jesus was in this story, okay? All right, you ready for the story? Okay, it's only about four or five minutes, okay? I want you to pay really close attention, okay? Because I'm gonna ask you some questions at the end, okay? All right, let's go ahead and run it. The man I'm talking about was not a Scrooge now. He was a kind, a decent, a mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men, but he just did not believe in all of that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. He told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm just not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now, shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair, began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, then yet another. At first he thought somebody must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled out there miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm in a desperate search for shelter. They had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sound. Well, he couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze. So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes, and he tramped through the deepening snow to the barn, and he opened the doors wide. And inside the barn, he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So he figured that food would entice them. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow, making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms. But instead, they scattered in every direction. Every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange, terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me. That I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now. If I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid, then I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them, wouldn't I? So they could see and hear and 
understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears. Above the sounds of the wind. And he stood there listening to the bells. Adeste Fidelis. Listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. Paul Harvey, I hope for you and those you love, this will be a wonderfully Merry Christmas. All right, kids. How many of you saw Jesus in that thing? Okay, this is a little kind of tricky for you. What did you see? I think the guy sort of represented Jesus and the birds represented the many people that reject him. So that's why they were fearing him because many people also fear him for what trauma they've been through on earth. Boom! 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 What do I need to be up here for? You got it. You got it. You got it. That's it. What a great, what a great story. Okay. Uh, If you're here today and if you don't know the Lord, maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're fearful. Maybe you're afraid that if you actually do come out of the shadows, if, if, if how you're be living, if it's actually revealed, maybe you're not sure that those around you will accept you or if God will accept you. Or maybe you're, you're, you're just like the young brother who says, I just want to live my life, man. I'll, I'll eventually come to God later. I just want to live my life now. And maybe, maybe you're at the point where he got to your sin. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Whatever the case may be, the best gift that you could receive this year would be the gift of salvation, is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. He came out of heaven, so we would understand, just like the man says, I, I, I want to help these people, but I'd have to be a bird to help them because they're afraid of me. God became a man to help you and I. Give your life to him. Let him lead you. Let him take you inside the warm barn of his love. You'll, you'll never regret it. Let me just pray this as we close. Father, I pray for every single person here today, Lord, who, who feels far away from you, who is discouraged, who is lonely, who is, who is just being torn between, I, I know God is real, but, oh man, I, I kind of like living my life. I like doing some of the stuff I'm sure God doesn't want me doing. I, I would just pray, God, today, Lord, that they would just they would just come to you, Lord. They would just let you lead them. Maybe what's inside that barn is, is something that they never realized they'd have. Maybe, maybe what they're eating now would be nothing compared to what you have for them, but they'll never know until they give you a chance. So I pray, Lord, that they give their life to Christ here today. And you can do that just where you, just right where you sit, right where you're at. Just, just before this night's over, just slip away maybe. And say, Lord, I want you in my life. I believe you died for my sins. I believe that's why you came the first time. You came to die. And I'm going to receive you. And I'm going to give you my life. I want to follow you. I know you'll take care of me. Lord, I pray for all the people here today. God, I pray they'd have a fantastic Christmas. I pray, God, that if anybody here is going through a tough time, God, that they just would have been encouraged by the service here today. And so, Lord, uh, just thank you so much that you did leave heaven, Jesus, and you came here. You showed us how we're to live. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, what do you say? One, two, three, say amen. Amen. All right, kids, you can head back to mom and dad, okay? Let's go ahead and stand.